This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Sounds good. So David Shaw attended Stanford and got his PhD in computer science in 1980. He then worked in the field of education at Columbia University, where he was on the faculty until 1986. At that point, he started working in computational finance or on financial computations. And in 1988, he founded D.E. Shaw. Recently, he has started working, or I'd say in the past few years, has started working on simulations of molecular dynamics. And what they're trying to do is come up with architectures and algorithms to do much higher speed computation than what is currently being done to enable a whole new area of research that can be used to do things like protein folding synthesis. Um, he also has served on President Clinton's Science and Technology Advisory Council. So if you're interested in engineering education, he's been on the panels for those things as well. Please welcome David Shaw. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, am I connected? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. OK. Um, well, let's see. I, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today about um, something different from what's uh, usually come to be called computational biology these days. And let me just say up front, I've got sort of a, a hidden agenda here, which I want to make unhidden now, which is that um, I think that less time is being uh, paid and less attention is being given to this area I'll be talking about today than a lot of other very important other areas. Um, most, of the, uh, most of the interest in the past few years, um, specifically on the part of computer scientists and even some engineers, has been to things like um, figuring out how to decode the genome, uh, trying to figure out the networks of how proteins interact with each other, doing things that are often called bioinformatics, all of which is extremely important. And I'm going to race through a couple things to give you a sense of why that is, um, but which is very different from the kind of things that my research group is interested in, which is three-dimensional in character. So I'm going to try and interest people in that, uh, partly because it's nice to have um, colleagues and other people working in the field. And I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit um, so, uh, oh, I just saw, hi guys, <laughs> sorry, uh, um, but uh, what I'll try and do is give you a little bit of background and tutorial on some of the biology and then uh, move into some things on uh, computer architecture uh, and on um, some algorithms that we've been developing in our group. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly when I'll run out of time, but I'm going to put the algorithms at the end because this is, you know, although it includes both, this is sort of more electrical engineering focused and I'll try and spend some time on a specialized supercomputer that we're actually designing within my group. Um, so let me start with a little CliffsNotes version of some of the basic biochemistry that drives what we're doing. Um, as most of you probably remember, um, the code for the proteins in the body uh, is made out of DNA. And what that's divided up into is a bunch of little nucleotides, a bunch of base pairs, and every three of those codes for one amino acid. Um, and those amino acids come in about 20 varieties. There's some redundancy in the coding. Um, and the set of amino acids then gets um, connected together in a long chain, just like beads on a chain. But the part that's interesting about them comes when that chain starts to fold up on itself. Um, first into what's called the secondary structure. And what's shown here is, let's see, does one of these things shine light? No, this is a pen which does not shine light. Can I swap microphones with you? I'm sorry? You have hum on your microphone. I do? OK. Oh, I think I was just humming, that's all. No, I like doing that. So. Unless you're what do I do? Oh, I wonder <laughs> if it's 60 cycle. Maybe it's standing next to my laptop? Yeah. No, it's what do I do? Is that right? Okay. okay. Now the problem is that's what I have to look claim, at in press. Claim that this one is better than that one. Oh, okay. Good. So it's true and While I'm doing that, I'll um no myself. <laughs> what does this do? I always like to have the right number of things that connect to each other. <laughs> 
Okay. Is that an antenna or something? Good. Okay. Yeah, now it's this for Turn it on. <laughs> oh, these. How's this? Is that working? Good. Okay. So I think we're up to secondary structure. What more problem? The guy in the back there, if you listen, it pumped up so you can see it. Oh, wait. So I look there? Why don't we just done the whole. Oh, sorry, what are you telling me to do? You're on. I'm on. Great. We're up to how this thing winds in a uh, what's called a secondary structure. This particular one winds in a coil. There's some under that form little sheets. But what you're really interested in is then the whole assembly folds up into a three-dimensional structure called a tertiary structure. And that gives it its, its three-dimensional form, but it also brings together parts of that uh, long polypeptide chain that have similar uh, chemical properties to allow them to bind to each other and to a variety of small molecules within the body. Uh, and since my research group is really interested ultimately in helping, pe helping give people tools that they can use to someday hopefully save some lives, that's the part that we're interested in, the part that's biologically interesting and may eventually lead to some new drugs. Now, where are we right now? Um, there's been a very exciting thing that most people are aware of, which is that we've essentially decoded the human genome. Um, we've got, you know, we know where most of the proteins are. We actually don't know all, in all cases which parts code for proteins, um, but we're very far along the line toward getting that sort of information. But what we don't know is, first of all, what the three-dimensional structure is of all of those proteins. We actually have, through painstaking elaborate efforts, figured out the three-dimensional structure of a surprisingly large but still minority subset of those proteins. But there are uh, ver various other ones, especially some of the most important biologically and pharmaceutically, for example, proteins that are stuck inside membranes that we don't know the structure of at this point and that are very important pharmaceutically. Um, we also don't have a very detailed picture of what most proteins actually do and especially how they interact together in these complicated networks, metabolic networks and signaling networks where one does something to another and then that person communicates with two others and so forth. We really need to decode those kind of pictures. Um, so basically what we've got is an elaborate parts list with little obscure codes. Um, what we need is to know what those parts look like, um, how they fit together to make various things which are literally in some cases little machines inside the cell that kind of rotate and do funny things. I'll show you a picture of that in a sec. Um, and then how the whole machine works, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, my daughter's the one who suggested this. It's a little karaoke machine. So how can we get there? Well, there are two major approaches. Um, one is experimental. Experiments done in what's referred to as a wet lab because many of the things are sloppy, wet chemicals. If that weren't enough to dissuade you from actually doing these <laughs> sorts of things, as my sister does back there, um, you should still be um, more worried about the fact that you need to do elaborate and obviously impossible things at very tiny, uh, very tiny length scales that somehow people have figured out how to, how to use. Um, and there are many interesting things that we'd like to see that we simply can't. Nobody's figured out the right kind of experimental apparatus, the right way to ask those questions. So the other approach, which um, we're taking in our group in part because I wasn't trained to do experiments. I was the one who always used to pipette all liquids into my mouth when I had my first lab. Um, what I was trained in is computer science, and we simulate things. So what we're interested in is simulating from the ground up based on um, atomic level interactions um, things like how proteins actually fold, how they structure themselves into three-dimensional structure, and then once they're folded, how they interact with each other, and when one interacts with the other one, how it changes shape and so forth, um, how it interacts with other proteins, also with various nucleic acids, um, and in particular with small organic molecules of the sort we find inside the body, 
and mimics that we try and come up with in many cases, which are drug molecules that we can administer. Now, the gold standard for that kind of simulation at a very detailed level is called molecular dynamic simulations, where basically what you're trying to do is simply integrate Newton's uh, laws of motion, do it at a very fine level over a long period of time to see what happens uh, when proteins or other biologically interesting macromolecules actually move around uh, in real life. And the way we do that is to divide time up into a lot of little time steps. Um, they unfortunately have to be very short because of, first of all, various technical reasons. You need a stable integration of these laws of motions. If your time steps are too long, the whole thing blows up numerically. Um, but also because interesting things happen at that sort of time scale. Um, and the, you know, the relevant time scale, you can play a few tricks to get you within a factor of two or three. But basically, you have to f um, simulate things where each time step is on the order of a femtosecond, you know, one uh, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Um, then what you do on each one of those steps is calculate all the forces among the various um, atoms that are there, uh, more generally particles. We represent them differently in different cases. And then evaluate those forces using what's called a molecular mechanics force field. And I'll show you an example of that just to get across some of the computational problems that we're dealing with. Um, and then move them a little bit each time, again, for a very short period of time. If you do it for too much, the atoms get on top of each other, and they really don't like that very much. I'll show you mathematically what that looks like in this, uh, in this force field. And then you iterate it over and over and over again, um, and eventually make an integration that shows you what the real trajectory is of the molecule of interest. So let me just first give you an example of this. And, um, this is a short MD simulation. This particular one was done by a member of my research group, and I th think it will loop around. Um, it will last 13 seconds on the screen, which will become relevant later on when I talk about performance of this machine. And what you're actually seeing is a fragment of something called a defensin. It's a type of protein that um, is found in the bronchial epithelium. It's uh, one of the things that helps protect us, one of the lines of defense against uh, bacteria. And then you're seeing a bacterial cell membrane here. And this is actually just a part of um, the defense and molecule, which is known to be active, even this little fragment. Uh, and what it's doing, nobody knows quite how it works. It somehow disrupts the bacterial membrane um, and kills it. But nobody knows whether it burrows in or causes it to split apart or whatever. And John Klepeis and my group did a simulation of this. And you'll see that what it seems to be doing is to get attracted to the outer part of these phospholipids. It's attaching itself. And we actually, for various reasons, we started working on some other problems. So we don't know exactly what it's going to do in the next, uh, the next you know, version of this, um, this serial. But it sort of shows you how you can explore new areas. And at the very end, I'll give you some idea about some longer simulations with some realistic new things we've just recently discovered. Um, but this will be a good example for the main point I'm trying to make, which is that what you've just seen here is much too slow. That's just two nanoseconds of simulated time. And just to give you a rough idea, interesting biological things start to happen at the level of sort of milliseconds for the most interesting ones. And this took um, 3.4 CPU days to simulate on a conventional machine. So it's just much too slow to get interesting things. Now, in our group, what we're trying to do is to do simulations that would allow us to essentially just look at what happens in practice. And an interesting thought experiment there is to think about what would happen if molecular dynamic simulations were, first of all, perfectly accurate, which they're not, and also infinitely fast. In that sort of asymptotic case, what we could do is perform arbitrary computational experiments with perfect accuracy and look at, you know, try and figure out what protein structures are simply by watching them actually fold. Sometimes they get a little help from other proteins, but we know from experiments that in vitro, we can put them into a little dish, and we can get them to actually fold up, in most cases, to their native structure, the one they adopt in the body. We ought to be able to see that in simulation. Um, so in general, you would try and figure out what happens by actually watching it uh, happen. And that doesn't make all the problems go away, but the theory would be that in the long run, we could translate this problem, transform the problem of uh, experimentally looking at things, you'll still have to do that. You need to have experiments to validate um, various things, if nothing else. But we could actually watch things occurring and then wind up with this enormous wealth of data where we could do computational experiments, essentially a data mining problem, to find out what of interest is going on there. 
Um, now, it's a hard problem, but there are two different varieties of it, one of which is much harder than the other. Um, one of them is to simulate a large number of very short molecular dynamics trajectories. Um, <clears throat> and that's something that's being pursued by some other researchers, and I'll mention one. It's a very exciting area, but it's a, an easier problem. Uh, applying it in a clever way is very hard, but um, from a, an architectural viewpoint and a computer science sort of viewpoint, that's a much easier problem than simulating one very long trajectory. And the reason is simply that you need to have a great deal of parallelism to solve these problems. Uh, we just need too much speed up to do it any other way. And you get embarrassing parallelism if you're what's called embarrassing parallelism, um, something that's easily broken down with essentially no communication if you simulate many trajectories fast. Whereas if you simulate a single trajectory for a long, long time, that's harder to parallelize and so far has been outside the range of what people have been able to do beyond about a tenfold level of parallelism. Um, so it is surprising how, how much people have actually done and probably the leading person ha who has done, um, who has applied many short MD simulations to answer interesting biological questions is actually B.J. Pandey here at Stanford um, who's done some remarkable things using many slow computers um, in a sort of distributed processing approach. And it has a very low cost, partly because VJ gets people to um, volunteer their computers, sort of like SETI at home. There's a project he has called Folding at Home. And he's got something like 100,000 different users who turn on their computers and try and win the honor of being the ones who contribute the most time. And he's done experiments with folding and the determination of binding free energies and other things that are important to chemists and biologists. biologists and has done some very clever mathematical work to infer things about long trajectories from looking at, um, looking at a lot of short trajectories and assuming certain sorts of chemical models. Um, it's an excellent work, but our problem is a little bit different. Um, it requires very high performance, also requires truly massive parallelism, a very high level of parallelism, and lots of interprocessor communication if you do it with standard sorts of approaches. So we've had to develop entirely different ways of formulating the chemistry, the um, the biophysics, and the algorithms that are used to solve some of these problems. Um, our goal is to have uh, single millisecond simulations um, that you know, take place with something like 64,000 atoms. Uh, we always use you know, powers of two, of course. Um, and uh, with explicit water molecules. I won't have time to explain this in great distinction, but most simulations now are performed using a model of water, you know, in a system like this with 64,000 atoms, it might be something like six or 8,000 of them are actually um, atoms in the solute, in the protein or other biologically interesting molecule. The rest are water molecules, which you have to have surrounding that. Otherwise, you get the wrong behavior. Uh, and that's very expensive. You spend all your time doing water. So people have come up with clever, yeah. How, how many water molecules? Um, it would be the difference between that. So uh, I used to be able to subtract. It's probably, you know, in this case, it would be maybe 56,000 water molecules and only 8,000 protein. I'm sorry. Uh, so it would be 56,000 atoms. So that divided by three molecules. Total atoms. That's right. Most of which is water. So, you know, because on a sequential machine, um, you can break that out. You know, if you had just a single processor, water is the name of the game. You want to make that speed it up as much as you can. So people have come up with continuum models where they model the effects of water uh, by basically taking a look at the dielectric constant of water, um, looking at how it screens out electrostatic forces, and then throwing in some ions, because that's what's typically present inside the cell and between the cells, which also changes the electrostatics. That allows you to spend most of your time on these uh, solute molecules, the stuff that's um, sitting around in that fluid. And we want to do this uh, with explicit water because it's more accurate for a millisecond because that's where the biologically interesting things start to happen. Uh, let me just confirm this again. I, with questions, we can go to 515, is that right? 535. Oh, 535. OK, good. OK, great. Now, um, what I want to do is have some time at the end for questions, but also please feel free to ask me questions in the middle because it just will make more sense in, in context. Um, so let me give you an idea of some of those things that happened on a milli millisecond time scale. I've already mentioned protein folding. Um, a large set of proteins, although certainly not all, fold on the order of a millisecond. Uh, people have made some artificial proteins 
um, that have some protein-like characteristics that fold in as little as a few microseconds, but even that has been beyond the state of the art to get good folded structures so far by simulation. Um, the record at this point is about one microsecond, and two research groups have managed to do that. But if you can do a thousand times longer, many real large proteins, um, you know, come into play. And you can do other things with them. For example, look at the interactions between two different proteins. The one up here is interaction between a, a fair, you know, sort of a famous complex uh, called Barnace and Barstar. And actually look at that interface, how they selectively bind to each other, because we only understand in a limited way the mechanism of selectivity, the way these guys figure out exactly who their partner is and bind to it. Um, and also, this is a, something we're working on now, the binding of drugs to their molecular targets. Um, the one that you're seeing here is uh, actually, actually a part of c able kinase, um, which is the target of a new drug called Gleevec. It's actually not that new anymore which is an anti-cancer drug which has proved very effective for a particular type of leukemia and also a rare tumor, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and has now become the standard of care, first-line care for patients with these diseases because it really works. It extends lifespan. Um, so these drugs, this uh, Gleevec is an example of a kinase inhibitor. This is a very important class of uh, proteins called kinases. We know that it fits in, and somebody experimentally determined a crystal structure, a way of experimentally finding out what the structure of the kinase is and where the Gleevec fits in, but nobody knows how it works. Um, and uh, I actually may not get to it later, so let me just say that we've just got some results in our research group a couple of months ago where, for the first time, we're actually visualizing the dynamics of this. Um, first, without Gleevec, we can sort of figure out how kinase usually does its job by looking at what's called the kinase domain, the part that isn't regulated. And then we came up with a hypothesis from looking at an MD simulation um, that if a certain residue, a certain amino acid was protonated, uh, had a proton there instead of a charge that was shown, um, that it would actually move from one position to another. And we then did little computational experiments, protonated it, deprotonated it, and sure enough found that it went from what's known to be an active conformation to one that's known to be inactive, then simulated it with Gleevec uh, starting from the bound structure, found that Gleevec keeps it from being, keeps it in the inactive form, and that in fact um, protonation would cause that to happen, and made a prediction there, and which was experimentally verifiable, that if we altered the pH of the surrounding system, protonation would either be enhanced or inhibited, and that it should affect the binding of Gleevec. And I don't think I have a slide here, but, um, uh, but John Curian, who is one of the world experts on uh, kinases, just did some experimental work based on our hypothesis and gave us the curve for it. And sure enough, it exactly reproduces what we would uh, predict based on what we saw in simulation. Uh, and without going into much detail, there are also some mutations known where patients eventually develop mutations that cause Gleevec not to work anymore. And we can just see there's a little bump there when that mutation occurs. It keeps this one thing from flipping out. Gleevec can't get in there, and it doesn't inhibit the protein. Now, that doesn't mean that we can design better drugs yet, but in terms of understanding the molecular basis for some of the things that we see clinically, it's an exciting first step and something that hadn't been seen before because nobody had been able to simulate as long as we have. Uh, and that's for a different reason. That's on a regular cluster using an algorithm that I came up with, which I'll say something about at the end, that allows us to parallelize at a much higher extent than has been possible bef <coughs> excuse me, before. Um, so binding drugs to their molecular targets is one application. Another one which is much harder, and I don't know if we'll get to this even with our supercomputer, is to take a look at these big intracellular machines. Um, some of you may know more about this than I do, but this thing, I've seen it, you know, what it does depicted. This thing here actually rotates around like a little wheel going around and different things happen. And there are even more complex machines um, inside the cell, including one whose job it is to <coughs> read the genetic code and produce the proteins themselves. Um, it would be nice to be able to simulate those and see in more detail how those things work than we've seen before. Um, so what's it going to take to do this, to simulate about a thousand times more than people have seen before. Well, if you look at the actual numbers, currently a single processor will tend to, um, you know, roughly speaking, simulate 100 milliseconds. Uh, it will take 100 milliseconds to sing, uh, simulate a single femtosecond. 
Um, what we'll need to do to accomplish our goal is to get that 100 milliseconds down to 10 microseconds. So we're talking about 10,000 times faster than what you can do now on a single processor and about 1,000 times faster than what people have been able to do with the current parallel implementation of uh, standard molecular dynamics codes. Um, and just to give you an idea what that would mean in practice, um, this picture that I showed you before, um, the simulation you've seen is 13 seconds long. Um, and that's as fast as our super, supercomputer would actually do this simulation versus the 3.4 days that it takes now on a single processor. So it's not going to be an easy task for us to do this. Now, to see what it's like from a computer science and engineering viewpoint, you have to look at what it is you're doing in these repeated time steps. And without going through much of the details, certainly not any of the math, this is what a molecular mechanics force field look like, looks, uh, the force field looks like. It basically computes the energy uh, at each point. This is computing potential energy. It's actually going to take a derivative and show where the, the atoms move. But what you'll be doing is calculating um, a set of terms that are based on, first of all, interactions between bonded terms. If you've got covalent bonds between these various atoms, they exert various forces on each other. We want to model that with three different terms. I'll run through very quickly to give you an intuitive idea of what they are. Um, and then the, ter the atoms that aren't, bounded, uh, aren't bonded to each other still interact in a couple of ways. One is electrostatically, a classic positive and negative things, a char um, negative charges attract each other. And then the second one is through some fairly peculiar things called van der Waals forces that keep things stuck sort of close together but not overlapping. So let me just take you through it really quickly. Um, I have to show this because I spent the good part of the last year constructing these graphics, and I'm just going to show them to everybody, even if I give a talk <laughs> about something unrelated. So the first of the terms is one of the bonded terms. If you've got two atoms which are connected together, um, what we do in a standard molecular mechanics force field, this isn't ours, it's what everybody uses, is to model that as a spring, where you've got um, a harmonic force that basically keeps these things together. Um, at a preferred distance, and if it goes to a point where it's stretched beyond that preferred distance, then it'll generate forces that push the atoms back together again. Isn't this beautiful? Thank you. Um, and so it goes back to its preferred position. What it'll typically do is actually oscillate, and if it gets too close to each other, then you have a force that pushes it apart, and it sort of vibrates around that intermediate term, that intermediate position. Now, the truth is, it doesn't do that very well, and this kind of a term really doesn't look harmonic. It's not a quadratic expression. Uh, but that's close enough for this purpose. And in fact, if you got it more accurate, it still wouldn't look like the quantum mechanics because that distance is quantized and vibration is quantized at that level. But this is what everybody uses. And as far as we know, that's not biologically significant. Those discrepancies aren't terribly significant. There are other things where we're not as sure. And in fact, this is one of them. So here, if you've got three atoms, um, they have a preferred position with respect to each other. And again, what we do is monitor them with a quadratic term, so it's like a spring. Um, and if you push the thing out, then it tries to, it experiences forces that push it back together. If it goes too far in, it gets pushed back out. Um, there's also, this one is a little trickier. If you have four or more uh, terms, and in fact, what I'm showing here is ethane, uh, which has a total of some number of, or eight different atoms. Um, if you look at this um, on end, so you're looking down that axis, um, it wants to be in a position where these things are staggered like this rather than up against each other like this for a variety of reasons. Um, so if you just watch that thing turn into a slightly less preferred position, well, I should just say that what we're doing to model this is with a, um, a sinusoidal process. So right here, oh, it likes low energy. It's always trying to gravitate toward low energy. If I push this, um, so that it's getting closer, it's at higher energy, which it doesn't like. And when it's in what's called this eclipsed conformation, it's very unhappy. It wants to go somewhere else. Um, then moving on to the simpler non-bonded terms, um, this is the strict Coulomb interaction. And this is one you probably learned in introductory physics. Um, and this says that positive charges repel each other. And uh, if you have charges that are um, of opposite charge, then they push toward each other. And that's just modeled in the classical physical way. That's one of the parts of the force field that we know really works exactly that way. Um, and the final one is kind of a peculiar but very interesting one called the van der Waals term. Um, and that has the form of 
um, uh, a 1 over r to the 12th term and then a 1 over r to the 6th term that's subtracted from it. And the, uh, the sum of the two is this red line, but the, um, the green one is this repulsive interaction, this first one. Um, the attractive part is this blue one. Um, and if you look at the um, attractive part, that is relatively straightforward. It's something where these atoms kind of um, polarize each other. They have these dipole-induced dipole interactions. And so it's essentially an electrostatic-like attraction to each other. But if they get on top of each other too much, what happens is a fairly subtle, very beautiful uh, quantum mechanical thing that allows them to, that forces them to get put in different places. And it actually derives from the, for those of you who've studied physics in the past, from the fact that electrons are fermions and fermions, um, the Schrodinger wave uh, equation has this wave function, the square of which gives you the probability of being in any given point. But it has this peculiar property where, which is if you exchange two electrons with each other, the sign of that, um, the sign of that function has to reverse. Uh, when you square it, it's the same probability. But what it means is when the two are superimposed, if you have two electrons that are in exactly the same place, if you reverse it, the value of the wave function has to change signs, which means it has to be at zero. So that will never happen. If they're close, because of the continuity of the wave function, it gets close to that. It doesn't like that either. So this is kind of hairy one. And we don't know how well we're reproducing that. In fact, we know it doesn't really look like 1 over r to the 12th. It should have a, theoretically an exponential term. And it's one of the things we have to build into our machine to make sure we can experiment with this because other people haven't run simulations long enough to see some of these defects. And we may encounter some of them when we actually do these experiments. And this thing gets shoved apart and shoved in and so forth. Let me just move on. Eventually, we get to this force field. This is what we have to do um, every one of our time steps. And the reason it takes so long is you know, there are a lot of things being computed. But the inner loop, the part that's really the rate limiting step here, is the computation of mostly electrostatic effects um, between atoms that are separated by a reasonable distance, but not too far. And although I won't talk about this in much detail, the reason very, f very distant ones aren't that important is become, uh, because people have come up with these very clever techniques for representing the forces, the electrostatic forces between distant uh, atoms using one of several different uh, continuum models. One is using Fourier transforms. You essentially re reproduce it with something smooth. Um, another one is using a, what's called a fast multipole representation, which um, is something it's, it's a very exciting set of algorithms, arguably one of the most important algorithms of the last 100 years, not ours, of course, uh, but uh, which allows you to get a linear time, um, linear time algorithm for computing with minimal accuracy, less than the inaccuracies you'll have uh, elsewhere in the molecular mechanics force field, um, what those distant interactions are taken in the aggregate, uh, rather than, for example, n squared, which is what you'd get with a na naive algorithm. So we don't really care about the distant ones. But you have to, to get adequate accuracy, you have to explicitly take all of the n squared interactions between atoms within a reasonable distance of each other, some, you know, some distance r, the interaction radius, figure out all of those quadratic number of interactions, and do that on the order of 10 to the 12th times in order to get a millisecond worth of, uh, worth of simulation. Yeah? You're simulating multiple molecules. You must have enormous intermolecule positional uncertainty. So if you're doing do you mean quantum uncertainty? No, well, no. I mean, you know, whether basically you start the simulation with the two molecules like this, or you start them with the two molecules like this, and you're doing a lot of molecules. Yeah. <laughs> We're only simulating a single molecule typically at a time. When you want to really look at things like rotational degrees of freedom and have these guys find their partners, then you're absolutely right. That can take a long, long time. But a long time for any one pair to find each other. You know, if they're, it depends on the concentration and their standard chemical things that show you how long it'll take for various things to happen. But in our case, we'll typically not only start with just two and see how they interact, but we'll know something about which part of this thing is likely to stick so we can get roughly the right area. A single simulation one with these molecules. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, so again, we're orders of magnitude too slow. What are we going to do about this? And our um, our strategy is to do two things. One of which is to design completely new architectures, and specifically a very specialized machine with enormously parallel architecture. 
that's based on, in our case, special purpose ASIC, special purpose um, you know, application specific integrated circuits, which we're making. Um, and it will be dramatically faster in our simulation than current MD um, hardware and software is. Uh, there actually are some specialized machines people have designed just for this problem because it's so important uh, in the biological sciences and other areas of uh, physical chemistry. Um, but it should be much faster than that. Um, it will be completed, we think, sometime in 2008. And we're pretty sure it's going to work at this point. We're just submitting our first test chip. Um, but it's going to be very restricted in several ways that I mentioned before. That's all it's going to be able to do. Um, but what we're also doing is working on some new algorithms that are applicable not just to this machine, but to conventional clusters. Uh, and I'll, if I get a chance, I'm going to run you through some of what those look like. One basic algorithm I came up with that has an asymptotically superior result for the solution of the classic n-body problem when you have a range limitation, which is becoming the standard way you do that. Um, and that scales to a very large number of processing elements. And then there's other work in our group that's refined that, actually improved something in my algorithm, generalized the whole class, and figured out how you find these things. Uh, at least mention that briefly. Um, so basically, we've got sort of three levels of highly interactive groups working together. The first is computational chemists and biologists. Um, the second is computer scientists and some applied mathematicians. Um, and then the third group is computer architects and engineers, because we're building a, a real machine. Um, now let me start going through the architectures. Uh, I'll probably spend more time on that than the algorithms, just given the nature of the audience, or what I assume to be the nature of the audience here. Um, there are various alternatives you could use. The most obvious and what most of this work uh, is done on is conventional clusters of commodity processors. Um, which has dominated the field over the last 10 or 15 years. It's sad for those of us, us who were designing supercomputers with unusual architectures, but for very good reasons, that's been sort of the dominant way to do things for a long time. Um, the second is general purpose scientific supercomputers. I'll give you an example of that in a second. And then the third is these various types of special purpose molecular dynamics machines. Um, so let's see. First, let's just mention a few things about commodity processors. Um, one of their strengths is that they're extremely flexible. You can program them to do everything from word processors to highly specialized scientific applications. And they're also very cost effective because they are so general purpose. And we've got them on our desktops, and they're part of virtually all the different types of computing done in the world today. Uh, so you have mass market economies of scale. The limitations for this particular problem are, first of all, that this doesn't exploit various very special features of the problem. We, it's not like we could speed up any physical you know, problem much more than other people ha uh, have been able to. Um, we're not more clever. We're just focusing on a very specialized problem that has some structure that fortunately lends itself very well to specialized architecture. Um, it also eliminates or greatly minimizes various kinds of communication bottlenecks. Uh, both between processors and memory, and among the processors themselves. Um, and then um, the, oh, sorry, I'm talking about the later architecture. Yeah, it sort of flips it around. This kind of a commodity processor, you have big bottlenecks between processor and memory and among the processors. And also, you don't get as much actual arithmetic uh, power. To see that, this is a fairly well-known but unnamed uh, chip that's used in a lot of PCs. It's actually a slightly outdated version. And if you ask the question, what part of it is actually doing useful arithmetic operations for a problem like this, it's actually something like, I think I calculated like 2% of the area of the chip that's real arithmetic. The rest of it is doing very important things, but not important for solving our problem. Now, with the general purpose scientific supercomputers, the best known now is probably BlueGene, which first of all is the world's fastest computer, which I'm going to see tomorrow at Lawrence Livermore, but also was originally designed specifically. It's not really specialized for this, but the application that was sort of their flagship application was solving the protein folding problem, or at least looking at protein folding trajectories. Um, the strengths are flexibility. Even though it's a, a supercomputer, it's relatively easy to program. It's applicable to a very wide range of, of problems. Um, limitations are it's very expensive, um, and um, it's still not fast enough for our purposes because we want to go to this millisecond time scale. 
Um, now, the special purpose machine that we're designing has as its strength that it's very, very fast for this particular application with excellent cost performance characteristics. The major limitation is that that's all it does. It's, in theory, you could do other applications on it, but they'd be really difficult to program, and they wouldn't be particularly fast even if you went through all that agony. Um, so not very flexible only for this problem. On our machine, what we're trying to do is get speed ups in a couple of different ways. Um, one is through extensive arithmetic specialization. Um, and just doing that in the, you know, only having flexibility where we absolutely need it or think we're going to need it, everywhere else we just hard code stuff in to the logic on the chip with a few tables and parameters, but basically that's all it knows how to do. And then the second part is carefully choreographing the communication so that data flows exactly where it's needed. You almost never have to access, for example, off-chip memory except for very large problems, and that's not in the core inner loop. Um, there are two subsystems on each one of the ASICs. The first one is um, a f what we call a flexible subsystem, which is programmable and general purpose. Um, it tends to be especially uh, good for three-dimensional geometric op operations, uh, and actually it's four-dimensional in some cases because we use these structures called quaternions, which make certain calculations a little bit easier. Uh, and then a specialized subsystem, which does just pairwise point interactions, either between various uh, a pair of atoms or between atoms and a three-dimensional grid, which is useful for some of these distant <coughs> approximations that I mentioned before. And that specialized subsystem is extremely um, parallel. I'll just show you a picture of it in a, a couple minutes. Um, now, again, we use the specialized hardware only in certain, um, you know, in certain select uh, areas of the algorithm. Um, first of all, it has to be in an inner loop. It's got to be the thing that takes us most of the time or it's not worth doing in a specialized way. But secondly, it has to have a very regular algorithmic structure which allows you to build in a lot of speed. And not all scientific applications have that property. We just happen to be lucky that MD simulations do with the current molecular mechanics force fields. Um, and the third thing is <clears throat> we want to be relatively sure that the things that we're implementing in hardware are unlikely to change significantly over time. Um, so examples of those are things like these electrostatic forces. Um, we know that's basically right. And certain of the van der Waals interactions, like the attractive term, although as I mentioned before, the repulsive one is a little more problematic. Um, so here's an example of um, one of 32 particle interaction pipelines, and I won't try and explain what most of these are, even the general data flow, but all of the things that are colored blue here are arithmetic units, and there are 32 of these. Um, so a huge amount of arithmetic gets done on the chip at any given time. But um, it's very simple arithmetic in many cases. Like these ones up toward the very top, which I can't quite reach here, are doing, um, I'd originally envisioned it as six-bit arithmetic. I think it may have grown to seven now. And because the, oh, thank you. Let's see if I can master this one. Oh, this is great. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so these guys up here uh, are very narrow. And that's especially good because if you look at a multiplier, for example, on a chip, the area is quadratic in the bit width. So you're saving a lot of area when you have very limited precision arithmetic. And what we've been able to do is examine what these calculations really are, restructure the, the uh, force field in such a way that we can break it down into domains that have different precision. Um, and then in each one of those domains, we're computing with a different precision, always in fixed point, usually use floating point for these calculations, um, and economizing on the area to the extreme. It also has a flow that's strictly linear. Um, you don't have any places here where you do tests and then loop around. Uh, you don't have any branching structure. All of that has to be getting, has to go get done in this flexible subsystem. So this is really fast. The data flows easily. There's almost no area for wires and so forth. Um, and at a somewhat higher level, the data flow is also very regular. Um, the key thing that we were after is to make sure that data never moved toward a part of the, moved through a part of the chip when it wasn't needed there. Because you spend a lot of time sort of schlepping data all around. That's not necessary here. Uh, what will happen is, um, without going into too much detail, um, data will enter here on the upper left-hand corner, and then it will spread out in a wave-like fashion with new sort of chunks of data coming in at every time step, move down through here. Um, here I'm using time step differently. At every, every clock cycle, it will move down here. 
Uh, and what's going on in each one of those is that whole calculation you saw on the last page. So every one of these steps gets something useful done, and then you've got all the concentrated stuff that comes out the bottom, which is essentially forces between atoms, something you couldn't do for a general calculation. But when you can, in this kind of problem, you save a lot of things. First of all, there's no cash anywhere on the chip. That takes up a huge fraction of the, uh, the chips in, for example, uh, a Pentium. Um, the control logic is really minimal here because you're always doing the same thing. And very little space on the, very little area on the chip is spent on wires. Um, you also achieve very high arithmetic density um, and save the time that would be required for, for example, cache misses, load and store instructions, and just generally shuffling data around in various ways. Um, now, flexible hardware, we still use that, but we use it in a very limited uh, set of areas. One is where the algorithm is less regular, where we simply couldn't figure out a good way to do it in specialized areas. And fortunately, this is really just luck. It turned out that most of the things that we needed to do that were in the inner loop didn't fall in that category. Um, that's one of the reasons that I think much of the work we're doing here is not really generalizable, or at least we don't see, you know, we'd love to say, find a few principles that could be used by other computer architects, but much of what we've been able to do here, I don't think is sort of breakthroughs in new kinds of architectures in general, where people could say, oh, this is a great model, do stuff that specialize in one place and then flexible in another place. This is the way we should move forward with other kinds of scientific supercomputers. Maybe there'll be some lessons, but I think we really just lucked out that the problem structure maps very well onto this sort of architecture. So let me give you an, oh, sorry, the last one, which is very important, is we want to use flexibility in areas that we could have put into this high-speed part of the chip that's very specialized, except that we don't have as much confidence in the physics, in the, the places where we're doing classical, um, classical estimates that are, we know are approximations of the underlying quantum mechanics, but we don't know how good they'll turn out to be in practice. And we also don't know what the right functional form is. And by we, in this case, I mean um, you know, physical chemists in general don't know what's important yet. We'll have to do these long experiments to start showing up some of those weaknesses. So examples of things that we put into that flexible hardware are the bonded interactions. And you know, the reason for that is that even though each of them is fairly complicated and we'll probably get more so as we move away from harmonic approximations to things that are more accurate, there just aren't very many of them. You know, a given guy is bonded to you know, only a small set of other atoms, um, and so it's more like a linear time algorithm rather than the n squared that dominates. Um, another example of things that we would want to do is to look at different models of bond length constraints. I mentioned that that's a very simple model of that spring. Um, we may want to generalize that, but we don't know how yet. We've got to have something where we can change that. Um, and so we need to be able to experiment with these force field terms in ways we haven't been able to so far. Um, and to do that, we need a lot of speed, but not as much as we have in the specialized part. Um, and also various integration techniques. I won't mention anything much about that now. Now, in the flexible subsystem, in some ways, this is less interesting from the viewpoint of raw, raw speed. But it's worth mentioning here for the ones who are, for those of you who are computer architects, that we're using three levels of parallelism. Uh, one is multiple cores. We have a lot of them, and I'll show you how they're laid out in a second. Uh, the second is instruction level parallelism, sort of like a VLIW architecture, where we're doing several things in each one of these units at a given time. And then the third is SIMD parallelism, where at a certain level you can do the same instruction many different times in a different place on the chip. Um, this is the basic layout. Um, we are actually controlling the whole process, not so much doing useful arithmetic work, but you know, controlling the whole process using uh, cores from Tensilica, which probably most of you know about. We've generated a custom processor using their technology, which is quite interesting and very effective. Um, with, and we added some custom instructions there. But the real work goes on um, in these little units called um, geometry cores. Um, and there are a total of, let's see, eight of them here, but each is made up of a bunch of lanes. I always forget the terminology because there's several levels here. So let's take a look in one of those geometry cores to see what it is. Um, basically, here we've got the uh, three dimensions plus the extra one for quaternions and a few other random computations. 
Um, each one of these has a little lane that does a multiply um, and addition and has a little function evaluation unit, which is basically table lookup plus a uh, polynomial approximation to do interpolation. And you can also load it with a few other things to you know, do some other funny stuff. And everything um, moves down mostly this direction, but there's some links between them to do fairly standard kinds of uh, wide instruction word um, operations. Um, at the system level, um, it's worth mentioning that this whole, um, the whole system at a global level consists of what will probably be eight segments in our initial configuration of the machine loosely connected to each other. Each one of those segments will have 512 nodes, where a node is basically something that's based on an ASIC, um, organized in an 8 by 8 by 8 toroidal mesh, basically an 8 by 8 by 8 cube. I'll just show you that now. But with end around connections here, um, going from one side to the other. And the reason for the structure, the three-dimensional structure, is first of all because it mirrors the three-dimensional space, which is uh, communication efficient. Um, but also, with these um, end-around connections, um, it allows us to use what are called periodic boundary conditions. Um, the, what you're actually simulating um, from a theoretical viewpoint is not one system with a bunch of waters surrounding a given protein molecule. You're simulating an infinite set of those things that tile three-dimensional space um, and where the interactions can occur from one cell to another. There are technical reasons why that's a useful thing to do. Uh, we're using something. It's our own technique that's based on Fourier transforms, fast Fourier transforms. Um, it's a slightly different version than the standard one. But you need to have something that's globally periodic. Um, and you need to have each one of those boxes be wide enough so that this copy, there's an artifact, which is this copy of the protein in the simulation interacts with this copy. That's a non-physical force. You need to have enough waters in between so that that gets screened out to the point where it's not that relevant to you. So that turns out to be something that's easier if you have this three-dimensional structure with these end-around connections. Um, Communication, though, is still a massive bottleneck. And with the remainder of the time, I want to just I'll leave a few minutes for questions at the end. But um, I want to just run you through this algorithm for solving the end body problem in a way. Yes. I'm sorry? 45 minutes? I got, I got instant. I got replays. I must have hit a, a good score. So I'm sorry, how much more time? 5.45. Great. Um, so let's see, there are a couple of kinds of communi communication that are bottlenecks, and we're going to try and do it in an efficient way. Um, to execute a millisecond scale simulation, we're going to need a very large number of processing elements. And as most of you know, have dealt with parallel systems, the name of the game then is reducing the amount of, uh, of data that gets communicated between those processors. Because as you scale up, that becomes more important at some stage than the actual arithmetic going on. That's what limits the, how big you can scale the thing up. Um, and we can't do that without having fundamentally new algorithms. That's what's limited uh, the molecular and dynamics packages that have been used to date. Uh, a huge amount of effort has been put into developing them because they're important not just in biological sciences. You know, they're used for plasma physics and for you know, many different physics applications. Something like this is used for astrophysics, where you're using gravity. And um, you know, it's a very general kind of problem. Um, you have to restructure the algorithms, or you run into the same barrier that they have. So let me talk about this algorithm. The original one uh, is one I call the NT algorithm. It's short for neutral territory. And I'll show you why that is. Um, and just to restate the problem, the problem is for any given atom, uh, what you want to do is interact it. I'm having trouble finding this. This red atom has to interact with all the atoms that are within some distance r of it. And you don't have to worry about these guys here, uh, because these other distant algorithms are already known and very efficient for that part. So that's not the part. That is dominated in a conventional MD program by the nearby interactions, the n body problem. Um, uh, so. Let's see, asymptotic, this result that I'll be giving you um, is something which um, actually was surprising because most people thought the best you could do was a certain result. I'll show you what that is. And this gets beyond that using a very non-intuitive, counterintuitive decomposition of the space. Um, the, it turns out, fortunately, that the constant factors are such that um, even on a regular um, conventional cluster of, of commodity microprocessors, 
this gives you significant improvements um, for a, a standard MD code. And for a very large scale machine like the one that we're designing, it becomes very significant. And I'll actually show you real numbers in graphical form. Um, what we want such an algorithm to do ideally is to do two things. One is to exploit that range limitation, the fact that we don't interact all pairs of molecules, all pairs of atoms together. And earlier architectures that attacked this problem and related problems tended to be very efficient for the end body problem, but didn't make use of that range limitation, which for reasonable sized systems makes it an enormously more complex problem, which you can then speed up, but you're fighting against some against quadratic asymptotic uh, demand. And then the second thing is to scale up essentially indefinitely. Now I'm cheating a little here, but the basic idea is to get the data transferred, the amount of data transferred from one processor to another um, to scale down to zero, to approach zero as the number of processors approaches infinity. Now the reason that's cheating is that we're considering here only bandwidth, only the amount of data transferred. And in fact, when you get to a low enough number there, what you're going to run into is latency. Uh, you'll be bound by how long it takes to transfer even a message of size, you know, of one bit from one processor to another. And that does show up as a practical limitation. But here I'll just be talking about the asymptotics of the bandwidth uh, result. Um, so just to first of all give you the bottom line, the traditional methods that have been used, which are called spatial decomposition methods, um, they can exploit this range limitation. That's sort of a, that's what you have to do to get started in this area. But they have running, and they have running time which is proportional to R cubed. And that kind of makes sense, because if you had an atom here and you're acting, interacting with everything within a certain radius, I showed you two dimensions, but in three that turns out to be a sphere. It's actually a hemisphere because, you know, Newton's something law, maybe second or something, says you don't have to interact. Well, actually, it's more straightforward. You never have to interact the same particle more than once with each other. So you've got this hemisphere. Um, and if you interact with everything within that roughly spherical um, area, that's the, it's proportional to the cube root, uh, sorry, to the cube of the uh, interaction radius. Um, now, it's not, though, scalable with the number of processors. It runs into a fixed asymptote that I'll show you. I'll show you what that actually looks like for real numbers of processors. Um, the NT method, um, I wasn't actually aiming for this in the beginning, but discovered that it actually is proportional to R to the 3 halves, the square root of the amount of volume surrounding that atom. And it is scalable. Um, you know, 1 over the square root of P uh, is the term you get, and eventually it goes to 0. So um, in both of these methods, let me just give you some basic ground rules. What we do is we take um, the whole space, the three-dimensional space, divide it up into a little a set of little cubes. And each cube is associated with one processor that's responsible for all the atoms that fall into that cube. And I'm going to call that the home box of the particular atom. So this atom has as its home box this area, which is represented by one processor. Um, to see what's basically going on to, with the NT method, I originally thought about it three-dimensionally, but then realized it's not that hard to actually see what's going on if you look in two dimensions. Um, the basic idea is with a, a traditional method, um, you wind up with something where as the limit of the number of processors gets very small, it looks like uh, a circle. Uh, it's actually a little flattened out at the edges here. In the NT algorithm, um, the amount of, um, of data that you're going to exchange between processors, instead of looking like this circle, looks like a couple bands. And these bands here get arbitrarily small as the number of processors increases. Um, so um, basically what we're going to interact, one way of thinking about it, is two different areas um, uh, in two space. With the traditional algorithm, what we're interacting is this big area with a little tiny area, which is the original home box. So you always, what basically the, um, the standard decomposition does is it always interacts within a processor that stores at least one of the two atoms. You make it lucky and those two may already be in the same processor, but you always interact within something that, uh, within a processor that at least one of the atoms lives in. Um, and then, um, what you wind up with is a number of atoms that are imported that are equal to this blue area, and nothing has to get imported um, in this other area, this green area. Whereas with the NT method, the number of, uh, the amount of data that you import is just the sum of these two sets of blue, but it computes the same number of pairwise interactions, which has to be the case. Um, 
you're going to, to solve the problem, you have to interact the, the full set of molecules. Uh, and if you look at it, it's the product of these two areas. So essentially what's going on here is we're, um, uh, let me skip that part just in the interest of time. But uh, I think you can see the basic idea in two dimensions. In three dimensions, things unfortunately get much more complex. <clears throat> and in fact, if um, God had you know, had been willing to design the universe with any even number of dimensions, things would have been much simpler. Um, as it was, I struggled with Mathematica for days trying to get this all to work out, but eventually it did, and you get the same asymptotic and constant factor performance advantage. Um, you don't get cross products, though. I'm sorry? You don't get cross products. Oh, yep. Yes, you, yeah, that's right. Some things are better, some things are worse about three dimensions, but this particular problem is really pretty hairy. Um, and I won't force you to go through that. Let me just show you what some of the results of this are. I guess later on I'll just show you the math briefly. But, um, but basically, if you look at the three-dimensional version, um, the decomposition is going to turn into the home box uh, plus this hemispherical region around it. Um, and in that sort of traditional approach, you'll interact one of the atoms from the cubicle interaction box with one atom for, from either that surrounding interaction region or the imports, uh, or sorry, or the box itself where the first atom lives. Um, and the amount of interprocessor communication is going to be determined by sort of adding up three different regions, three different types of regions. One are ones that um, interface, in this case I'm showing an arbitrary box, not a cube, but in the traditional methods it's always a cube. One is the regions that come out a distance are um, and are attached to one of the faces of the home box. Um, the second type are ones that, are, that meet at just on one edge. And the third are ones that um, touch just at one of these corners. Um, so if you add up what the import volume is from these traditional methods, um, what you wind up is three of the face regions, six of the edge regions, and four corner subregions. And as the number of processors gets large, the only one that matters um, is these corner subregions. That's going to be something that's proportional to the cube of the interaction radius. The other terms drop out asymptotically. Um, and in the NT algorithm, um, it's going to be a little bit different. What we're going to have is um, an interaction box that's still shown here in green, um, but where neither of the atoms in general will live. And then the data gets imported from this little pole up here and from this half a disk on the side. Um, and I call this the tower. I'll just use this only once or twice. Um, and the part that goes around, I call the plate. Um, and the interaction always occurs here, even if the atoms live somewhere else. Um, even though both of them have to be imported, um, you wind up with less time being taken. So they meet on neutral territory, which is where the name comes from. Um, now, part of the NT algorithm is um, to basically optimize the aspect ratio of that home box. In each processor, you, can, you don't have to store a cube of space. You can tile the whole space with an arbitrary shaped box or, in fact, with other things that won't work as well on our machines. Um, and so you can vary the as We'll always have two of the dimensions be the same, but the height um, will be a different uh, height in general than, than the side length on the side. Um, that aspect ratio is a free parameter, and we can optimize over that to minimize the communication. Uh, and what you'll see actually in these pictures is that uh, in practice, the more processors that you have, the shorter and fatter that box gets to be. Uh, so let's just look at how it scales for real numbers. I'm assuming here. Yeah, sure. I don't know that I see how you account for the interactions of the matter in your corners. Yeah, they're going to go away. That's, that's one of the key things about the algorithm. The reason it has an asymptotic superiority is that you never have to have any cor corner subregions. You can prove that any pair of atoms can always, uh, there'll always be some interaction box for which any pair of atoms can interact here, and you never have to import data from the corners. That's exactly what it is that gets you. Uh, symmetry of the molecule that you're trying to. No, no symmetry is necessary at all. In fact, this works for you know, planets um, interacted with gravitational forces, or there's actually somebody who's using this algorithm now for plasma physics where you don't have, you know, you don't have any molecule at all. So it's a general in-body result. Yeah, I'm sorry, was there another? Or? Okay, let me, uh, let me just show how this scales down. This is one for a particular system 
I don't remember. I guess it's got 50,000 atoms. <clears throat> the radius is 12 angstroms, which is more or less re uh, a reasonable one, um, at least for our machine, that would be typical. And a density of a tenth of an atom per angstrom. Every cubic angstrom will store about 10, let's see, is that what it is? Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, there will be about one atom every 10 cubic angstrom. So all this is a typical kind of figure that you'll see in real systems. And at 64 processors, um, it's a little bit better than the conventional methods. And in fact, it's important to say that at very small degrees of parallelism, my method is actually inferior to the standard decompositions. And other members of my group, Kevin Bowers and Ron Dror, have now shown that there's a different method that's superior to the standard method that looks quite different from my method that's um, as about as good as you can do for a very small number of processors. But we're more interested in the very large scale ones. Um, and uh, this is provably optimal for that uh, degree of parallelism. So here we have some advantage, but as we get to a larger number of processors, here we've got 512, what you'll see is that the blue region is shrinking. And in fact, 32,000 processors is about the range where blue gene is and also where our machine is effectively. And here you see that the blue region has gotten extremely small precisely because there are no corner subregions anymore. This guy gets very skinny, and this guy gets very thin in that dimension. Um, so let's just look at the math and find out where that corner goes to. Actually, I guess all I'm showing you really is going to be the bottom line that you get, which is you've got four face regions, two edge subregions, but no corner subregion. Um, and so that's got you down from R cubed to R squared. And we're still going to go down to uh, a lower number, which is R to the 3 halves, but that comes from optimizing this uh, aspect ratio of the, um, of the interaction box, the home box. Uh, I won't run you through the math here, but um, in a straightforward way, we come up with a result um, that has a limiting uh, asymptotic complexity that's proportional to R to the 3 halves. Um, and the thing that actually decreased it was optimizing the aspect ratio. That gets it from R squared to R to the 3 halves. Um, and you'll also re-expressing that in terms of um, the number of atoms in the system and, and so forth. Um, you can see the asymptotic result that is proportional to R to the 3 halves, but also uh, proportional to um, number of atoms divided by number of processors, uh, the square root of that quantity which will drop to zero, giving you the, uh, the asymptotic result, which again is a lie because of latency, but shows where you get the practical uh, performance advantage from. So let me just compare them for you. Um, the, actually, we, you anticipated with, this, uh, with your question. Here, the problem is you're importing the corner subregions. Here with the NT method, you're not. That's the big advantage. Uh, I think I've gone through this enough, and I do want to have some time for question. Um, the, the advantage of NT is going to grow with the number of processors. Um, and if you see them side by side, you can see that. A little bit of advantage here, but as things scale down, uh, scale uh, down to, you know, smaller size and larger number of processors, you've got a very big method with the traditional spatial decomposition, which used to be thought to be the best. Uh, with the NT method and the related methods, the general class we're calling neutral territory methods, you're importing a much smaller amount of data. Um, incidentally, this, um, we think that this has some applications in other areas with higher number of dimensions. Um, for example, some machine learning uh, uh, applications. It will not get you out of what's called the curse of dimensionality. You know, that's something that appears to be inescapable under standard sorts of assumptions. But in some cases, it can cut down the effective number of dimensions um, from you know, n to n over 2. But we haven't really written that up, and there could be things that are wrong there. It seems like it should apply, but I'm not sure. Yeah? So in the traditional method, you only have to do calculations between blue region and the green region. But in your new method, you, you have to do all the calculations between blue regions and blue regions as well. That's right. right. Um, okay. In some cases, in the special case, you may interact between a blue region and a green region, or even within the green region, within one processor. But most of the time in the new method, you're interacting between one blue region and the other. And it seems counterintuitive because you're meeting somewhere where neither, uh, neither of the two atoms lives, but it can be shown that that's better, not just asymptotically, but in practice. Um, so let me just give you one slide that presents that um, quantitatively, and then I think I'll be ready for questions. So just one final thing about what keeps me up at night, because there's always something. 
um, uh, other than my two and a half year old who <laughs> has been responsible for it most of the time recently. Um, if we actually look at a, uh, a comparison of the two methods, with the traditional method, you approach this asymptote, which we saw in the mathematical analysis, um, with the NT method, eventually it's going to drop down to zero. And more importantly, um, it's going to drop to a very low number in a practical range here. And in fact, we have a paper that's um, uh, been accepted now, I can talk about it too, uh, SC06, the Supercomputer Conference, that compares uh, this to Blue Gene. But again, I should emphasize, we think the world of the Blue Gene project, there is a much more general uh, architecture, can do a wide range of things. And I happen to think that it's very, very cleverly handled a number of problems uh, that we wouldn't have known how to handle so well. Uh, but for this particular problem, when we do a head-to-head -head comparison, uh, what we found is that um, even on a conventional cluster, um, we can outperform by a substantial factor uh, using the, um, the large blue gene machine. And in fact, I forget what the ratio is, but it's something like um, one of our processors is equal to something like 16 of the blue gene one for the same problem set up in a comparable way. Um, but you know, once again, I would emphasize that that's not the fault of blue gene. And in fact, we believe that uh, blue gene, well, they're already developing some algorithms that fall into the category we've described as neutral territory methods. Um, and which uh, should give them a very significant speed up. So I don't think this is intrinsic in any way to the Blue Gene uh, project. But we have shown at least that it does work in practice. Um, what's keeping me up uh, at night other than Jacob? Um, the big problem that I'm worried about is the quality of the force fields. Um, as I mentioned before, nobody really knows how accurate these force fields are. And it's not even like we can try a variety of different ones because the parts that seem most worrisome, where we think the approximations are likely to fail if they do, um, are the parts that are very similar among the different force fields. Um, and nobody really knows that for sure because for some problems, we know it's very useful. Current force fields do a lot of amazing things. Um, not, you know, most of the work has been in other groups, but there's no question it's very, very <laughs> valuable. It's elucidated a lot of important biomolecular mechanisms. But to do really um, exciting things at the millisecond time scale, because we haven't been able to simulate that long, nobody really knows how significant those problems will be and what they will be, um, assuming we can even figure that out when we simulate that long. So our hope would be that if we can't do some of these amazing new things that um, you know, sort of been holy grails in the field, um, it will be because, we think, because um, even though we've got a, a single long trajectory, the force fields aren't accurate enough. We hope that we'll be able to look at that and learn something about why those force fields aren't as accurate. Um, we don't know we'll be able to fix it. We also may look at it and not be able to make sense out of it. Just know that after a long enough period, this thing goes off into some trajectory that doesn't really make any sense. It keeps getting stuck in a free energy minimum that's not the global free energy minimum. We get results that don't match experiment, and that's all we learn. But the hope will be that we'll be able to learn something there that will at least be a rather expensive negative result. Uh, and if we're lucky, we'll extend the range of things that we can do um, so that we can solve some new problems that haven't been able to be solved with uh, more distributed approaches. Again, I would emphasize that what's doable with distributed processing approaches is startlingly important. Very major questions have been answered. That's not really our sweet spot. That's not what we're trying to do. We hope we'll be able to do something new with these single long trajectories. Uh, and I think that's all I was, oh, I was just going to show you one other thing. I mentioned the Gleevec result. Another one is we've now got a simulated um, model of uh, something called the sodium proton antiporter. It's actually a class of different proteins. Uh, I won't go through this in detail in part because I can never find all of the relevant, relevant residues here. But basically, the model shows um, how, with some selectivity, one of these ions goes one direction, the other goes a different direction. Um, and what it does is selectively pump sodium from one side of the membrane to the other. And you can sort of see that happening, although I can't. Uh, um, yeah, I, I have a trouble, trouble visualizing it, but I know what the, uh, the basic model we've inferred from that is. And, You've got a little machine that sort of goes back and forth, and there are four different states we've identified. It's a little preliminary. We're still doing some work on it and haven't uh, actually submitted it yet for publication, uh, but that should happen soon. Um, I think that's it. So let me turn it over for 10 minutes of questions. <laughs>
what approximate uh, accuracy do you, do you expect? Of? Is it like half an angstrom? Or oh, um, the question was, how much accuracy do we actually expect? Um, and the question was, would it be like a half an angstrom? First of all, the relevant metric that people often use is the root mean square distance between the comparable atoms. It's not clear that's the best one um, because, for example, if you have a protein that's basically structured right but is tilted a little at some hinge, which happens very often, um, what you do is, um, for the RMSD measure, you optimally align the two and figure out the RMSD difference. And that number um, will tend to overestimate the error if most of the local structure is right, but the thing's a little bit bent. Um, but using that traditional uh, sort of model, um, good numbers are things like under two angstroms, you know, hopefully, you know, one angstrom, and for some sorts of things, a half, you know, even less than that, uh, to be a good pharmaceutical target. How accurate that gets, in principle, should be determined by the force field, not our machine. Um, there are other sources of, it, of inaccuracy that could have been introduced um, with our particular implementation, but we know from detailed simulation that's not the case. And in fact, our code has done, from a statistical mechanical uh, viewpoint, it's rigorously reversible at the bit level, which is not the case for most MD codes. Uh, and that has resulted in a very low drift of some parameters people look at, energy drifts and so forth. So we think it's very, very accurate. What we don't know, though, is whether the force fields will give us accuracy or whether you'll get things that are not only just a little off, they're just wildly off. You know, when we've done some simulations of fairly simple proteins, it gets stuck in, we have, can't simulate very long, but it gets stuck in something that you just look at it and you can see it's completely wrong. So the question is, if you do it long enough, will it eventually find its way into the free energy minimum or not? We just don't know the answer there. I can't, let me just first apologize, I can't see you very well because of these bright lights. So. Um, you know, it took me a while just to recognize my sister, so I won't always know where there are hands. Yeah? I, I'm more familiar, I'm less familiar with the molecular dynamics methods, but I, I'm familiar with uh, Greenberg's method, which is the corresponding method in astrophysics. And his decomposition, by the way, it sounds like your decomposition would work in his uh, arena as well. But uh, uh, his decomposition, he accepts a certain uh, error a priori and then does the decomposition uh, in knowing that, that, that he's going to accept that error in the simulation. Right. It sounds like you have a natural error lower bound uh, uh, which uh, uh, suggests your decomposition. With this gentleman's question about higher accuracy, perhaps just a different decomposition with a, with a newer force field might uh, get you to uh, uh, um, uh, the, the higher accuracy, or at least a test for higher accuracy. Right. It won't be the decomposition that does that in our case. It'll simply be the molecular mechanics force field. We can rigorously show that we get exactly, exactly what the algorithm is intended to compute. Now, as to how accurate that model is, a um, couple things. First of all, the Green, green Guard on Roqueland, that classic result, is exactly what I was referring to before about what I think of as one of the most important algorithms for many, many decades, certainly. That's the fast multipole method. And indeed, the thing that's so exciting about it is they've gotten a linear asymptotic result partly by, I mean, it's very complex analysis that gets you to that. But what they've done is rigorously shown that there are certain errors which can never be larger than some preset you know, error that you say in the first place. And then you have a very non-obvious result where you have these multipoles that get simpler and simpler and still remain within that error bound while staying linear. Or to first, but there's actually a logarithmic factor that's inconsequential that's buried there, but it's a very exciting result. Um, we have a comparable thing here. We have different parts of the computation. If you start with the force field, um, we can basically show that the amount of error we get in computing to a certain accuracy, independent of the machine, can be limited in some parts to um, something that has to be less than the end body interaction here. But I should emphasize, that's an easy result. Theirs was the hard one. In fact, all we're doing is piggybacking on similar distant results and saying, we can keep those under control using methods other people have basically thought of. For the end body part, that's going to be the limiting part. And we have to do that accurately enough so that we can, nobody knows how to really measure you know, what's adequate. But using the standard measures, we can get well under that. We can get to the point where the system is stable. But it doesn't answer the question of the errors introduced by the force field itself which we know are quantum mechanically inaccurate, we still don't know how bad that is in practice. Yeah. yeah. Is RACIC going to be able to handle uh, multipole representations and induced dipoles? Good, good question. It's not. Our chip will only, oh, sorry, the question is whether our chip will be able to 
um, handle uh, multipole representation and induced dipoles? Actually, the answer to the first part is no. We don't use the multipole representation, but we don't have to because we can show again that we can get just as accurate results in this other way. Um, computationally, I mean, it's actually relevant to the architecture. I'm sorry, you meant on the individual atoms, yeah. so you're talking about a polarizable force field. Um, yes, we will support polarizable force field, which also takes your second question, but we're going to have to do it in a very specialized way. Our machine only knows how to do point-point interactions, and some of the, um, some of the polarized, oh, sorry, let me explain what that is. Um, we model, in a conventional force field, what you do is you model um, each one of these atoms as having a specific charge that stays the same the whole time. Now, it's only the same within a particular environment. What you divide, you divide up your space of atoms into what are called atom types. So a carbon that's connected to an oxygen here and a nitrogen over there um, is a special atom type, and it'll have a different partial charge on it depending on that. You know, uh, there are different electronegativities. It'll suck a different number. It'll suck the electron away more of the time or less of the time depending on its environment. But it still models that the same way throughout the course of your simulation. Now, in reality, what happens is that even with the same bonded structure, if something else comes by, most simply with an electrostatic charge, it's going to drag some of the electron cloud toward it or away from it. That'll change things. And what makes it worse is it's not just, the, it's not just that it'll see one external charge. You might see things that create a dipole, where you have a positive or negative charge near each other. It drags it in, in principle, um, unboundedly complex ways away from this fixed partial charge. Um, and there are people who have looked at polarizable models where, for example, you'll model that atom in a more realistic way as a little dipole itself that can fluctuate or um, as things where charge gets shipped ar shifted around in various ways. We have to use something which in principle can reproduce that um, but which only uses particles. So what we're doing is using a Druda oscillator uh, model. I don't know if you, you know, have seen those. And basically, you can simulate, if this is all you want to do, you can simulate a dipole by having a little pseudoparticle that's right nearby. You have a nucleus here, and then you have a little pseudoparticle that carries a charge. This thing can move closer to or further away this atom, and it can also rotate around it to simulate a dipole. Not, it's not actually a perfect dipole, which would require it to be infinitely close and infinitely large charge. Uh, but neither is the real molecule. So, um, you know, it's also got some finite distance here. So we can do things roughly like a standard polarizable force field, if there can be said to be such a thing, using this pairwise model, simply because that's the only thing our machine understands. And nobody knows what the best, nobody knows how much you can get from a polarizable model. Maybe that'll fix a bunch of the problems that we have, but we don't know if that's the case. So we're doing collaborative work with uh, Rich Friesner's group at Columbia, they have a, um, a dipole-based model. We're then adapting that to Druda particles, but using their parameterization. We're going to see if that works, and then we're going to move on from there. That's the plan. We're, we're, pretty, we're out of time. Oh, OK. Sorry. And so those of you who still have questions, you come down and, and ask them in person. Uh, Dave, thank you very much. It's been a great day. <laughs> thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.